My name is Sergio Caltagirone. I'm the Vice President of um, Threat Intelligence here at Dragos. Once a year, we step back and produce this year in review report like uh, many folks do. And the idea here is, you know, what can we learn that, uh, you know, what can we learn from looking back that we couldn't learn while we were in the firefight? And this is a great opportunity, um, especially in industrial controls where we fundamentally don't have a lot of data. Uh, you know, really, it was 2009 was the last year um, that we didn't have a, a, a single piece of public information about an industrial control attack. Um, and so, you know, we're only, you know, we're only talking 11 years ago that really this problem became a public issue. So we're not, uh, you know, we're not too far down this path when you look at information security and cybersecurity in general, you know, where we have 30, 40 plus years of uh, working on these problems. Um, you know, this is in industrial control where, um, you know, we're just kind of getting started. And so it's very important that we use all of the data that we have um, to kind of make the best decisions we can at the moment. Um, budgets are always, you know, tight. Uh, manpower is always difficult. Um, and, you know, so it's always hard to say, well, what could we do now that actually makes a difference? I like to say that most organizations um, if you don't focus an organization cybersecurity program, you know, most of the time they're going to be fighting the boogeyman. Um, you know, nobody knows what, what really the threat looks like or what they should really do. And they just kind of, you know, go after whatever they think might be, might be bad. Um, and so in this, in, in this type of report, what we really try to do is try to help people focus on what are the key elements that should really be done now to make a big difference. Um, we published three different reports. Uh, the first report is um, on our threat, in, uh, threat intelligence. So what were the bad guys that we saw this year? What were they doing? Um, and how did that affect industrial operating environments? And then maybe a little bit of a forward-looking statement on, you know, where do we see things going in the future? Uh, you know, what are the trends that we see moving forward that are concerning to us? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Another report we produce is on our vulnerability analysis. Uh, which is the only comprehensive ICS vulnerability assessment uh, in the world. And so what we do is we take every single ICS vulnerability, whether that's uh, published by government or private entities or companies or the, you know, the developers and uh, manufacturers themselves, and we basically analyze every single vulnerability that comes out. And our question, and we, we also independently test most of those vulnerabilities to, to ask the question, okay, is what is being described really the vulnerability at play here? And if this was in an operational environment, what would the impact of this vulnerability be? Uh, and so this is an area where it's challenging because you can't just use um, traditional, um, you can't just use traditional vulnerability kind of risk scoring because industrial environments are different than IT environments. Um, now, they're not, you know, I, I like to say that and to make be clear, like there's, a, there's an overlap, right? That IT and OT have, there, there is a place where we, we come together, but realizing that traditional information assurance uh, and information security is exactly what it says. It's about information. And our cybersecurity in industrial environments and in ICS is, is about process security. And these things, and this is why they are separate and slightly different from each other. One focuses on protecting information. The other one focuses on protecting a process, a physical um, engineered process, actually. So, um, so the risks, how we apply risks in information security are not congruent exactly to how we apply risks in understanding in industrial environments. There's, of course, an overlap, and, you know, we try to Bar beg, borrow, and steal from as, as many opportunities as we can from each other, um, but they're not the same. And so this is why we try to take a fresh look at the problem from an asset owner and operator's perspective. And the last report we reproduced, which is actually really fascinating um, because it's one of the few opportunities to actually look deep into what's actually going on on the ground, is our, um, uh, is our, our services and operations report, right? Our incident response um, and this is a question of, hey, we do lots of responding in the year across a huge number of sectors, electric, oil and gas, um, rail, manufacturing, mining, so forth. And so in these environments, what actually happened and what are the lessons we could take from this? 
Um, and so that's a really fascinating thing because that gets you an on the ground experience of, hey, people are dropping into these environments trying to figure out what the heck is going on and what can we do, you know, what should, what should we know about that um, and how can we do that better? So that's kind of how we kind of look at all this data and we produce three different reports because each have a slightly different perspective of what needs to happen. And honestly, if we were, put, if we were to put together a 75 page report, you know, nobody would read it anyway. So it's a little bit better if we kind of split it up a little bit and give each its own focus. Um, and it makes it a little bit more consumable for everybody. So, um, so now let's go ahead and uh, meet the panelists here. So Selena, would you like to start? Sure. Thank you so much, everybody, for uh, coming to hang out with us. My name is Selena Larson. I am a cyber threat intelligence analyst on the threat intelligence team. Uh, my contributions to the year in review report this year was uh, working on our threat landscape and activity groups report, um, as well as assisting Kate and Reed with our vulnerability reports as well. Um, so that's going to kind of be what I'm going to be chatting about a little bit today. Uh, of course, reminding everybody, if you want to have uh, ask any questions, feel free to throw them in the Q&A. If we don't get to them, we'll definitely cover in our blog. Uh, so thanks again for uh, coming to uh, hang out, and hopefully we can share some interesting findings with you today. Hey. Awesome. Ben. Yay. Thanks, Ben. Hey, Serge. Yeah. Uh, thanks. So yeah, my name is Ben. Uh, so I, I lead both the R&D team as well as the professional services team. So that last report that uh, Serge was mentioning from the, you know, the, the boots on the ground perspective, uh, it was it was uh, 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 being sourced from my team and, and the engagements that, that uh, we've been doing over, over the course of the last year. Uh, and you also you'll note if, if you've been reading our year in review uh, year in review reports for a while, you, the the kind of the narr narrative or, or, or depth of content has changed quite a bit of as, as my team's done more different a uh, different variety of engagements. Originally, when we started off a couple years ago. It was really focused on IR uh, and, and as well as uh, hunting, and, and it's since broadened out to more proactive services, penetration tests. So, so we have a lot more uh, different ways of measuring and, and anecdotes that we're giving as well. So pretty excited about the report and, and to jump into it today with everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Hey, Kate. Hey, my name is Kate Vida. I'm a senior vulnerability analyst on the intelligence team at Dragos, and I was one of two authors, reads the other one, of the vulnerability report. And during the year, I'm a part of doing the assessments for all of the vulnerabilities, figuring out how accurate they are, what the risk associated to them are, and gathering other information to add so that it's valuable for people to understand what the actual risk is. Uh, so yeah, basically all of the data that we have from this last year is both reading my work that we put into this. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, let's, let's, let's kick it off and uh, get some good discussion going here. So Selena, um, let's start with you and the, the threat side here. Um, so, uh, you know, I've been a, a lifelong intelligence analyst and, you know, the number of times I've been wrong, you know, I don't have enough fingers for is that's the life of an analyst. Um, so Rob, right, Rob Lee and I, you know, years ago, we hypothesized that we wouldn't see threats cross over different sectors. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, but yet this year in 2019 became a really important year uh, in that, uh, in, in, in disproving, right, that hypothesis. Um, so, you know, we saw some, some, some groups doing it. So what, why do you think we were wrong? What changed? You're really starting off with a tough question, Sergio. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, I can understand, uh, I suppose, the initial reasoning to think that, especially you know, years ago when you would have made the assessment, um, because you know, fundamentally, industrial sectors are a lot different um, from device types to the way that they interact with different equipment, um, to the networking infrastructure, even you know, down to the plant personnel. Uh, and also, you know, years ago, uh, ICS cybersecurity was still a fairly nascent space, especially for adversaries that were targeting the industrial sector. Um, there wasn't a ton of, of you know, openly available tools and data to sort of learn infrastructure and systems. Um, and for an adversary to sort of develop these targeted capabilities um, for one industry, it would require a lot of investment in resources, um, your people that are doing it, uh, certainly the cost as well. Um, and and they would have had to sort of prioritize targeting based off of a, a variety of different factors. And if, especially if we're talking about from the sort of state backed or state sponsored actor perspective, um, it would be based on the, the specific sponsor focus, whether that be national security, military, you know, socioeconomic, geopolitical, things like that. Um, and you wouldn't want to make a significant investment in multiple ICS development capabilities if it didn't necessarily align with your overarching goals as an adversary. 
Um, but now what we've seen, and certainly over the last couple of years, is there are a lot more ways for adversaries to sort of understand the lay of the land, um, certainly learn and use these devices and software that are within OT. Um, and these environments are becoming you know, more connected. Um, that sort of enables these adversaries to use familiar tools. Um, we're talking, you know, Windows PowerShell or RDP to sort of interact with, you know, IT and OT. So this idea of, of, of this quote unquote digital transformation um, and, and IT, OT convergence, you know, a lot of these buzzwords that we hear are certainly speak to this trend um, of allowing these adversaries to cross over easier. Um, the environments and the processes are really unique. Um, but this idea of digital transformation has made things um, a lot easier and, you know, a allows adversaries to sort of expand their reach a bit more. Um, and that kind of also speaks to sort of the interconnectedness of OT that lends itself to, you know, a an increased threat landscape when we're talking about things like ransomware or sort of commodity malware. Um, you know, ransomware authors uh, have, have been able to make malware that either automatically spreads through IT, um, whether we're talking cred capture, mimicast, things like that, or potentially targeting these domain controllers and active directory to spread. Um, and sort of these flat networks, which you see oftentimes in sort of less mature environments, you know, mean this, this type of ransomware can really easily cut across IT and OT. Yeah, I think that's been a fascinating story, right? I mean, IT in general has been struggling with ransomware for, for a while now, almost a decade. Um, and uh, in ICS just seems like the 2019 just seems to be like the big year it kind of popped. Um, I, I mean, I feel like it kind of caught us by surprise uh, a little bit there. And, and I mean, as we hear more about it, do you think it actually caught, do you think, do you think it crept up on us? And, and uh, you know, what do you think the implications are for ransomware and ICS? Yeah, so ransomware at ICS is kind of interesting. Um, I don't necessarily think it crept up, so to speak. I mean, 2017, we saw WannaCry and not Petya, certainly not Petya, more malware than ransomware, but, you know, this, this similarly um, wormable or automated propagated, propagation that we saw certainly targeted a lot of uh, OT environments with significant financial consequences. Um, and, you know, we, we saw a lot of operations being disrupted um, in a lot of ways due to this sort of flat network, the ability to sort of bridge the IT OT boundary. Um, but that, I think, you know, was, was pretty interesting and kind of served as, as a wake-up call. But we didn't, you know, as towards the sort of tail end of 2018 and, and certainly through 2019, there has been a certain uh, a spike in, in um, ransomware targeting uh, ICS and uh, uh, even being able to sort of disrupt operations. I would say, though, it kind of coincides with a trend that we're seeing at ransomware in general, um, this sort of idea of, of you know, targeting these uh, big game hunting, I guess, is like the phrase that we'll use, right? Like going after these entities that actors know will have a, you know, will pay a lot of money or will, you know, lose a lot of money if their processes are disrupted or if their, you know, financials go down. So we've seen a, a kind of that, that trend, but it kind of goes, goes along with, we've seen a lot of like municipalities, for instance, colleges, universities. Um, it's, it seems kind of interesting uh, that ransomware as a whole is affecting uh, a lot of different uh, industries in general. But I think that, you know, ICS is certainly unique because it, ransomware does have the ability to sort of disrupt these industrial processes, even by accident, right? Um, and so, uh, so, so I don't know if it necessarily crept up, but it certainly exploded <laughs> on the threat landscape in 2019. Yeah, yeah, I, I was, uh, I was at an, a utility company actually yesterday, um, and we, uh, we had a good conversation about something right in that, during, in 2019, there was an interesting case, right, of where we had a, um, where there was a ransomware attack against an electric utility in South Africa. And the uh, attack, though, only disrupted the the uh, web application, the the website for the um, the electric utility. And you know, in most cases, we'd be like, "Oh, well, that's not a big deal. Okay, it didn't harm operations. Yeah, the website went down, and maybe there might be some business operations disrupted, but electricity is still going to flow." Well, that that's a very honestly European and and North American focused kind of view of the problem. Uh, when in a lot of countries, South um, in in Africa, in South America, um, in Asia, uh, people pay on you know people pay as you go for electricity, and so when they took down the website, people couldn't pay for electricity, and so it stopped delivering electricity to customers, um, and that became a de facto operational outage, right, for the electric utility. Um, and that's an interesting one because obviously we're moving towards that kind of model in the United States. 
uh, to uh, pay as you go electricity, uh, to distributed energy resources and things like that, where more of the, the, you know, more of the workload is being put on the end, right, of, of electric grids. And so, um, you know, I think that that's an interesting case that I've been using when talking to especially electric sector customers on how does business operations and traditional ICS operations, how are we bringing this closer together in, um, in, that ex in those types of cases uh, where we may not know that our, we have systematic risk. Um, so yeah, I think that this is absolutely interesting how, how we see quote unquote digital transformation, bringing these things together, bringing more risks along uh, with mm -hmm. it, so. Well, yeah, and on that note too, yeah. just sort of like supply chain, uh, logistics is a big one um, that I think that we've seen uh, certainly recently there, there have been a couple of, of logistic company disruptions that ultimately sort of impacted down the, their supply chain and deliverables yeah. that could have potentially impacted certainly manufacturing if they're, you know, getting equipment delivered, um, the distribution, things like that. So it is, it is really, you know, you kind of think of it granularly when these incidents happen, right? Like, oh, another ransomware attack. Okay. But if you kind of think of throughout the supply chain and ultimately the affected you know, individuals at the end of that line, uh, it's not, you know, oh, just another ransomware attack. It does have, you know, more broad implications for supply chain, I think. Exactly right. I think it's great. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a very difficult problem. And like you said, I think ransomware is like right now for me in industrial, it's almost like rolling the dice, right? It's like we have not done these systematic risk assessments. Um, and so actually on that note, <clears throat> Ben, so your team is responsible uh, for, you know, doing these assessments in industrial environments and getting companies and, and organizations prepared for stuff like this. Um, you know, you've had a huge and honestly an amazingly long career in actually providing on the ground support to industrial environments worldwide. Um, is, are we actually improving fast enough? And, you know, where should we be focusing our efforts? If, if this stuff's happening to us and we're like, oh God, we didn't understand how these things were tied together. You know, where, where should we start? What should we do right now? Yeah, uh, so uh, on the, I think we can never move fast enough. Uh, uh, it's kind of a, a challenging proposition. A, a lot of a lot of just uh, security in general is uh, uh, a certain level of, of responding to the, to the world around you and trying to trying to catch up with it. Uh, so uh, that's certainly that's the challenge. It'll always be a challenge. But from from our our approach uh, on just trying to tease out uh, where the architecture is and and, uh, and and where where the maturity of a particular client is is largely uh, we focus not necessarily on uh, say frequency but more on consequence so so what uh, really teasing out what a really bad day looks like uh, uh, for for the, that particular facility uh, and then uh, which is uh, largely in a uh, conversation with engineering teams and in, in the, the, the business line itself not necessarily with the, the security teams uh, and, and then we start backfilling from there of uh, well, well, with, with that consequence in mind, where the the systems and then scope to, that could really uh, uh, create those sorts of uh, scenarios, uh, and where the security controls around there, and and start doing uh, threat modeling exercises. Uh, so, so that's largely our approach on on the assessment side. Uh, that that's kind of the uh, the first step in, in a lot of our customers who may not have approached. Uh, the 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 security arena quite yet, and just getting uh, acclimated to uh, appreciating what it is uh, they have and, and what kind of plans they need to develop, is largely understanding what the, the worst case impact is, uh, and then it's uh, uh, the very traditional well, what exact let's validate what we think is on our network uh, uh, versus what actually is on our network and, and doing walk downs and, and asset inventories because uh, often often the, the customers don't have a good visibility into what's in, in their environment in the first place uh, so that that's all the the uh, blocking and, uh, uh, and tackling that that's really required in, in some of the, the initial cases yeah so on, on that note exactly Ben um, you know, one of the things I think found most interesting, and, and this is something uh, also funny because uh, during, uh, while I was at our booth at RSA, I had a lot of people come up to me and ask if there was, was a typo. Because in our reports, uh, we actually say 0.0% right, of, incident, of um, incident response cases inside of industrial environments um, had the data ready and prepared and available 
to conduct an actual incident response. Um, and to me, that's an, one, it's just crazy, right, in my mind, having obviously done information security for a long time. But two, I think a lot of, it throws a lot of people off in that, wow, is this really the case? Um, you know, and Mark uh, here asked that, that exact question up at the very beginning, um, which is, can you, you know, what, what does that mean for OT and ICS right now? Um, <clears throat> and what does that mean for critical, critical infrastructure as a whole, if that's, you know, what a, what a crazy number that really is? Yeah, uh, it's definitely, uh, as we've done the year in reviews, uh, we come up with hypothetical things that we think is true. And then we start measuring it over the year to see how accurate it is. Uh, so that was one of the ones that uh, we, we uh, added in, into our quantifications at the, the beginning of last year as far as, well, let's see what this number really looks like. Uh, but the, the, it's really an implication of your, our, our ability to respond to it or, or even uh, have a detection capability in the first place. Uh, the, a lot of the, the level of effort and challenges of uh, creating visibility in the environment, often it, it's e the easy win is to deploy visibility uh, capabilities, uh, whether it's firewall logging or, or what have you along the perimeters, like that's very approachable. Uh, it, it can be done without uh, heavy um, uh, uh, coordination uh, with uh, the, the vendors and OEMs. Uh, uh, but the challenge is, even if you have a really great incident response plan, you don't. Well, you you can execute that incident response plan, and, and it'll fall flat pretty quickly because when you get to detection and and, and scoping, uh, there's no data for you to actually base anything off of, uh, and, and so. The, the the challenge with just visibility inside of industrial environments. And this this is largely uh, the concepts and principles that Dragos was founded on from the very beginning, because this, this has been a challenge for uh, 10 plus years now, is just gaining visibility into what's happening on the in the environment, uh, what's malicious, uh, what's benign, what's misconfigurations. Uh, but all of that is crucially important data from a forensics perspective. If you're doing root cause analysis, uh, whether it is uh, uh, discovering the piece of malware that's been in your environment for 10 years and trying to isolate, has it been 10 years? Uh, how, when did it cause to uh, uh, root cause analysis on ransomware or, or a more advanced activity group uh, activities? It's all dependent on what you're collecting today uh, or really what you were collecting uh, six months ago in order to start answering those questions. Yeah, I think it's the same thing I, I, I bang on, you know, I bang on the table every time I get up and talk is it's visibility, 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 right? Yep. If you can't see it, it doesn't happen. And if it does happen and you don't see it, you have no idea what to do. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, it goes back to, you know, this is crazy that we're still at the point where we're not seeing almost anything. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I've been I've been talking about this for a while now, but I, I love the the cases that we've had. Uh, so much the, the the biggest impact I believe, like uh, if a couple meetings can can go a long way. If you can get if you have a forensics person, uh, that forensics person likely doesn't know anything about your facility. So sending them on site, uh, that person will have. Uh, We'll, we'll go to what they know, uh, the, the, the Windows systems and, and focusing their analysis there. If, they, if you sit down, have them sit down with the engineer and have a discussion between the two of them on, these are the types of data that are valuable. And then the engineer say, oh, well, I have, I have air logs on my controller. Would that be valuable? Absolutely, it would be valuable. Uh, and, and it has been valuable in, in, in uh, uh, at least one case, uh, top of mind, uh, over the last year where we were able to identify scanning activity uh, 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 based on the air logs that are in the controller. So there's there's this uh, OT-centric uh, need of just understanding the technologies beyond beyond the network infrastructure, beyond the Windows systems, and really just how the the, the DCS or, or the applications themselves behave and what artifacts they leave. That is uh, extremely invaluable for the forensics person, but those conversations often do not occur. Yeah, it's great. So we need to start those conversations. Um, great recommendation. Um, so Kate, um, Kate, it's it's kind of cool. I think I, I one thing about vulnerability analysis is I think it's like a it's it's now become 
now that that quote unquote hacking is kind of what you kind of learn as you get you know get started at infosec um you know vulnerability analysis i think has become the dark art um of, of infosec right and there's a huge amount of myth surrounding it right in terms of like zero days and so forth i mean these are you know, we talk about we talk about vulnerabilities in this really kind of odd sense right of of um of like awe, we're in awe of these vulnerabilities, blue keep and, you know, so forth as, you know, as we kind of move forward. Um, you know, so you've, you've had a long career doing vulnerability assessments and analysis. Um, you've found several zero day vulnerabilities yourself. Um, you've worked as an asset owner and operator managing vulnerabilities in electric grids. Um, you know, what's the, what's the myth that you find most difficult surrounding them? That, that you wish, you know, you, we could break down a little bit so people could understand uh, what the in, actual impact of vulnerabilities are. Well, I think, I mean, it's gonna be different between IT and OT, but in OT, these devices are insecure by design. So a lot of the vulnerabilities that we see and people will hunt down trying to patch all day, uh, they really, the patch doesn't exactly fix anything. It might fix the web service or something else, but it's not gonna fix the underlying problems of how these protocols and the equipment is actually designed. So um, I think that's probably the biggest, I don't know how much of a myth it is now because I feel like we've been saying it for years. <laughs> it depends on who the audience is too. Um, but yeah, I'd say that's probably the biggest myth. So do you, so when you mean insecure by design, can you, can you define that for everybody? Well, I, I just mean that each of the protocols, let's say that I could turn, it, turn off the device based off of just sending it a certain command as it's designed to do through its functionality, how an operator would do it. Like that is how you could take over it. That's how you, you know, exploit it in a way that you want it to do what you want it to do, regardless of what the operator wants. And I think because that is so much easier than dropping a zero day or, you know, trying to find something that wasn't patched, like it's just easier to use its actual functionality um, than it is to try to exploit a zero day on these devices. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, so what you're saying is that just by, just the functionality alone provides enough, um, you know, enough of a, uh, uh, a risk to the environment um, that we don't need to look to, you know, we don't need to look to zero days as the, uh, as the boogeyman in the room. Yeah. That and patching. Like if we okay. spend all day, all our days patching, it's really just not going to get us there. It's figuring out how these devices are supposed to function, what they are supposed to be communicating with, which protocols they use, what's normal and like through the documentation and actually documenting stuff that isn't already documented and just trying to truly understand what the risks are per device. Um, and it can be done. It takes time, but that I think is a lot more valuable than hunting down the zero days. And, and what's a truth that you've like learned in your, your career so far, you know, working vulnerabilities in OT environments that, that you would like to share with others? I know there are always going to be issues and it's all about being strategic and understanding those risks, um, monitoring properly. I think like we, if we fight towards trying to fix something that's just, it's never going to fully be fixed. So it's really important to just be strategic and understand where the actual risks are, what you actually care about, um, and monitor for those things. I think that's probably the biggest truth. That's awesome. Okay. But of course, if we don't have good information, you know, about these vulnerabilities and our information, our, the quality of information being published is poor, then our ability to make a risk assessment is, is, is just as bad, right? Right. I mean, you definitely need to, I mean, I guess if you want to have people around you or maybe buy products that help you understand that risk better and find that information for you. But yeah, I guess it's, it's kind of impossible to do on your own. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of gets to the supply chain question too, right? In ICS, which is, um, you know, who, you know, there in, in just, let's just take the U S alone as an example, right? There's like 1400 electric utilities, uh, you know, about, um, the numbers go from down and so forth, but um, fundamentally, like, is every one of them now responsible for testing, you know, the patch coming out and so and so forth, or checking, you know, to make sure that the, the, the patch hasn't been, you know, messed with and things like that? Um, you know, how do we scale? For the supply chain, I think it's very important that vendors not only, you know, obviously they should have their software tested, provide a hash that goes with it, make sure it's centralized where everyone's getting the patches from the same place. I think it's really important to just follow the chain of where the patch comes from so that doesn't have like just if you were like if you had evidence in forensics and you're trying to make sure it's fine for a legal case like same thing for your patches you don't want to make like you need to make sure it hasn't been modified before you install it trust your source have certificates um, you know being encrypted in data at, like at rest and in transit all of those things are really important to make sure that that chain isn't broken while you're you know pulling data from places. 
Okay, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, doing the basics there. Exactly. That's a good one. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's pop back over to Ben here. And um, so Ben, would you, I guess, would you like to ta you know, kind of go a bit more in depth into the, um, into the report this year and kind of some things you found that were interesting? Oh, uh, yeah, let me, uh, so a, a good conversation I was having with uh, Greg, who's on my team, actually, from uh, a, a tabletop exercise perspective, we were, we were chit-chatting on, on things that didn't make it into the report, actually, uh, but the, well, uh, from all the, the tabletop exercises and incident response plan reviews that, uh, that we had done, uh, there were really only two of them that that uh, uh, we felt kind of hit the mark from a uh, uh, coordination between the, the, the local facility and the, like the, the central sort of security operation SOC sort of function. Uh, and there's a, this huge disconnect where, where the, the facilities themselves are trained on uh, ICS, uh, not industrial control systems, but on incident uh, command systems and uh, in, in the, the structure around handling uh, uh, the uh, uh, a, a particular crisis uh, in the crisis management there, uh, and also only two of the the, the incident response plans that accounted for that structure of crisis uh, crisis management. The the other ones had this uh, uh, idea that the the incident response plan was owned by by the SOC and and and, and, and the, the 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 centralized team, and and they were. The, the ones coming in and saving the day, if you will. Uh, the, the reality is that the, the facilities themselves are are the ones that need the the uh, capabilities and, and are on the front lines there. Uh, so it, it's kind of inverse uh, uh, in, in a lot of these cases where that the facilities themselves are the most critical component. They're the ones that are driving a lot of, a lot of the response functions. Uh, but that hasn't uh, necessarily connected in uh, on on the incident response planning cycle, where where again, uh, really only uh, excuse me, only two of them have have shown that that capability of combining like how they how they deal with crises or, or weather events uh, and 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 add in the the cyber uh, cyber security response piece to it, um, and, and I think that's a really important aspect of, of where the, the industry needs to move to uh, on, on the, the, the different teams and, and how they collaborate and, and who's in charge. Uh, a lot of that is with, with uh, the increases of uh, opportunistic attacks, like uh, really important to, to uh, start betting, getting right and practicing towards. So you, um, yes, yeah, so you mentioned, uh, you know, this, the actual incidents and the incident response planning. Um, but, you know, in, in your report, we talk about 66% uh, of our incident response engagements in 2019 involved adversaries accessing the ICS networks from the internet. Um, you know, what does that mean for, you know, uh, for the IT and OT teams here and, and, and for ICS in general? Yeah, I, I think Selena touched on it a bit uh, in, in some of her opening remarks regarding the, the activities beyond the activity groups. I think uh, uh, Sergio and, and team, you do a really great job of highlighting the, the activity groups that uh, we are tracking in ICS. Uh, the, but from, from a numbers basis, and I don't have the, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but uh, th it's largely uh, opportunistic attacks. It's not to say, that's not to say activity groups aren't opportunistic, uh, but there, there, there's a whole another uh, uh, activity or, or threat model out there that is, say, based on ransomware opportunistic sort of accesses through misconfigurations or, or, or improper architecture. Uh, that is is really uh, uh, what that number is illustrating is that the 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 level of sophistication from a, a protective capability, uh, if, if it's not high, uh, uh, there are folks out there that, that are, are scoping that out or, or just stumble upon it. Uh, and, and then that's the, the, the position that the facility's in at that point from, from a, a response perspective. Wow, um, so how, so on that, on that theme, right, um, we also talk about in the report that 76% of our red team activities uh, couldn't have been, couldn't be de detected in an ICS environment. 
Um, yeah. So, so what does that what does that mean for for everybody? Yeah, so I I I think as a community, uh, we've been on this, this track for a while. The the, the largest area of focus for the for the te- uh, last ten years, I would say, and, and rightly, has been on uh, let, let's uh, revise our architectures. Let's make our our architectures uh, m- with the the protective controls that they are uh, doing the the legitimate separation and zoning of, of what a, a good structure looks like. Uh, but what we as a community, I would, I would argue, have kind of uh, passed over or didn't take into account was that we can't just put in static controls and, and then we're good. There, there's a level of defense that we need to do as far as understanding what's going on in these environments. Uh, so a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of our pen testing uh, aspect, which is uh, some of our uh, like uh, really most interesting cases, uh, are uh, they're ranging from lab environments to, to uh, uh, maintenance windowed environments to can, uh, just move from a corporate environment into into the the, the OT uh, environment, whatever that is, TCS or, or what have you, uh, the, and. Largely, uh, even even on well architected systems, uh, it, it, uh, we can gain access uh, into those environments uh, not by leveraging weaknesses in that the, the, there wasn't a Windows patch there, but leveraging weaknesses in in, in either the configuration or, or the the application itself uh, uh, to gain entry. Uh, but the, all of the the perimeter or all of the the visibility controls, the detection controls, are really at the the, the perimeter, uh, uh, if if they have any at all. Uh, there isn't a host logging. There there isn't uh, capabilities within the the OT environment that are centralized or or, or looking for lateral movement, uh, and and so those are areas. Uh, that my, the the red team my, my uh, pen testers exploit in in order to gain access to there. We we've only had a handful uh, of customers that were actively monitoring while we were doing the red teaming to see if they could detect it. Uh, 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 but we've never had a call. Um, I I believe of hey w- we caught you. Uh, uh, we we saw you on this host. Uh, that, that that largely just it does not happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's unfortunate yet, but uh, hopefully we'll get there, right? Um, so the uh, so so Selena on the threat side, you know, what was something cool, you know, um, from an analyst perspective that that happened this last year? So um, that's a good question. You know, I hate saying things like cool because it kind of makes it seem you know, like taking a positive spin on malicious activity, right? Because <laughs> um, I think, you know, a lot of the stuff that we track is, is pretty cool and interesting. Um, but I would have to say from the perspective of actually leveraging and operationalizing our Intel, one cool thing that we actually did was uh, collaborate with uh, MITRE on uh, creating the ICS attack uh, framework. Um, basically, what we were doing is we were, you know, taking a lot of these vulnerabilities, a lot of our intelligence, a lot of the behaviors that we have observed with um, some of the activity groups, and we're able to sort of, uh, alongside, you know, the larger community as well, sort of help develop this ICS framework for ICS attack framework um, for defenders. So, um, from that perspective, I think that that was pretty cool to be able to sort of see and visualize a lot of, you know, our intel and a lot of the work that we've done, kind of being able to to be created into this framework to help defenders. Um, but from more of a of sort of an attack perspective, some of the interesting findings I think that we observed kind of goes back to what Ben was saying in terms of having um, kind of you know, getting some of the basics done, like having a lot of the attack vectors were these remote access, uh, either vulnerabilities or you know just remote access that was uh, open to the internet, maybe not vulnerable, but you know open RDP, things like that. Um, and so, these sort of, you know, uh, path of least resistance, I guess, not, you know, super complicated, these, these, you know, adversaries that are, that are looking for an easy way in commodity sort of malware, um, were able to, to target a lot of these um, sort of remote access portals. Um, We also saw that too, with some of our activity groups, certainly Parasite, 
um, this was an activity group that very quickly weaponized um, multiple VPN vulnerabilities that were revealed, I believe, uh, around August, um, the Black Hat timeframe. Um, very quickly, we're able to, to, to take those, uh, weaponize them, target, and attempt to exploit. Um, and so we have seen that kind of actually with um, uh, a lot of those activity groups, certainly Magnalium and Parasite, being able to take those you know, vulnerabilities that are out there and very quickly using them. Um, so that was uh, certainly an interesting uh, trend, I think, that, that we saw this year. Yeah, so what, you know, uh, of the three new groups that were identified in 2019, what, what do you think the implications of that are for the future? So I think, you know, we can maybe, we can approach this individually from the three new groups. I'll take Parasite very specifically, um, because this was a very, an interesting group that we have had observed, you know, targeting um, multiple geographies, multiple um, industries as well. And we assessed that they served as an initial access group for uh, Magnalium, uh, which is a, another ICS targeting uh, activity group that we've observed. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to sort of see the collaboration between these two groups, essentially serving, you know, setting up uh, initial access to for Magnalium to potentially perform um, additional uh, activity or operations within a, a target environment. Um, that's something that I think we'll see, you know, with other activity groups, we uh, uh, certainly kind of some, something similar with Electrum and Sandworm. Uh, so that was, that's something I think that we might, you know, see moving forward in the future. Um, but from an overall sort of identifying through new activity groups perspective, um, we also found some new ones last year as well. And I don't think that you know, this is, has ended, right? Um, part of it is because activity groups, like we kind of mentioned earlier, are becoming, you know, more capable, more, more bold, you know, multiple, having multiple targeting um, options and capabilities, but also, you know, as visibility is increasing across the sector, right, we really hammer on this idea of like, get better visibility into your environments. As visibility increases, the amount of attacks and behaviors and, and, and stuff that we're going to see will just fundamentally increase as well, just because we're going to be seeing more of it. Um, and so I think that sort of points to what we can expect, you know, going forward into, into 2020 is, is I'm anticipating, and certainly I think the rest of my team is too, that we are going to keep finding um, these, these groups and new behaviors. Um, but the flip side of that is it's good, though, too, because we're going to be improving visibility and, and hopefully security as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always a visibility problem, right? Um, the threats are generally always there. Just whether we see them or not becomes, you know, the bigger question. Um, so, Kate, from the vulnerability side, what was something interesting that happened, you know, this last year? Oof, something interesting that's happened this last year. Um, I actually wasn't prepared to answer that. Uh, Great question. <laughs> um, I don't know. I feel like all the vulnerabilities that we have and we're um, looking through, we're just trying to find patterns and what what do we can what we can do to kind of make things push forward and I think Selena touched really well with um, talking about monitoring and a lot of the cases when you know there isn't anything you can do there's no patch there's no um, like a lot of the advisories don't even have patches I think only 30 percent this last year we saw came with a patch um, and not all the time the patches actually worked in fixing the problem so I think a lot of the time it falls back on monitoring for behavior and understanding more and more how the devices actually work and what to monitor for. And we're finding like blocking it or patching it isn't really the solution when you should be monitoring it. I think that's just kind of where our trend is going. So, so in our assessment, our vulnerability assessment, we say that 70%, 77% of vulnerabilities occur deep in the ICS environment. Um, what, what, you know, what do you make of that? Oh, um, that, that is also dependent on like the Purdue level model. Um, and when we say deep inside the environment, we mean level zero and one. Um, and that's like, if you've, com if you've actually designed your network in that way, then it would be further into the network, which means at that point, if you're on the network, you can like ARP these devices, then you already can mostly tip them over, do whatever you want with them anyways, because of their insecure by design functionality. So um, when we say deep within the network, we're assuming that you've actually followed this model, but if you haven't, then that's when it spans out into the rest of your network, however flat it might be. Um, that's, that's probably the interesting part with that. Wow. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that gets really deep, right? I mean, we're talking zero one, uh, vulnerabilities, right? Uh, at that point you have to, you know, to, to be able to exploit those vulnerabilities, you already have to know, you know, the, the operations of that environment pretty well, um, to have gotten that far. Uh, so let's take a few questions from the audience. 
Um, so we've got a lot of good ones and I love it. Uh, so keep dropping them in the Q&A channel, everybody. Um, those we don't answer, we will answer actually on our blog. So all the questions will get answered and we will, uh, you know, so, so maybe just not here. What's the, um, what's the best way to find activity groups and campaigns working against ICS? Who wants to take that one? Selena, you want to, you want to take that first? The best way to identify uh, activity groups and campaigns working against ICS? Yes. Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, it kind of depends. I mean, certainly uh, what we, you know, are working on the threat intelligence team, uh, certainly what we advise is um, detecting and using um, threat behavior analytics and looking for um, adversary behaviors uh, as opposed to relying on indicators of compromise. Um, so that's something that we really hammer home and what we're looking for um, as uh, threat intelligence analysts, threat hunters, right? So we um, are out there identifying these uh, types of threats and what we're working off of is something called the diamond model of intrusion analysis. Uh, and so essentially what we do is we identify um, victimology, infrastructure, TTPs, um, and as much as we can about uh, a certain adversary. Um, and when all of these different uh, data points and, and uh, are, are differentiated enough from what we had seen before, that's when we're able to classify um, a new activity group. Um, so what we've seen, you know, largely historically uh, hunting for and, and, and you know, trying to, trying to find things in your own environment is a lot of times um, we're relying on um, certainly indicators of compromise. Uh, but those alone are not enough to be able to detect this sort of malicious activity. Um, so effectively, you know, what you want to be hunting for or looking for is known behaviors. Uh, IOCs can change super easily, but, you know, if you think about uh, people's habits, whether you're, you know, an adversary or whether you're just a, a regular human person, right, we usually wake up at the same time every day, drink the same coffee. Um, that's kind of something similar as adversaries tend to use similar tools, um, similar um, initial access paths, um, very similar methods uh, uh, of behaviors once they're in um, an actual environment. So, you know, that's certainly something that we really uh, hammer home a lot and, and hope our customers are using that as well, is, is, is leveraging these threat behaviors um, to, to search for and identify actors. Excellent, excellent. So this next question feels kind of like a gotcha question, and uh, I've had to answer this uh, before. Um, so, uh, so Ben, uh, this one I'll throw over to you. What is the industry or industrial sector that you've seen been most improved in cybersecurity for OT? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I saw that in the backlog. I figured you'd ask that, Serge. Um, uh, let's see. So I would say, I, I'd say I'll, I'll give two angles, uh, which dovetails on one of the other questions that was asked as well. Uh, so if you... A, a, a very U.S. centric uh, uh, view uh, of the world is like uh, uh, there, there's the U.S. and everyone else, and, and the U.S. is doing security really well, and like we have like uh, questions on how how others internationally are doing. I would say that's largely untrue. I, I've seen some uh, uh, certainly so, some uh, underwhelming facilities uh, globally, but I've also seen some that have uh, really solid programs uh, in place in regions in the world that you would not expect. Uh, so it's it's not a, a question of ge geographically uh, what the what the posture looks like. Uh, it is it is more tied to industry, I would say. Um, the, and to answer the question directly, over over my uh, so I have a bias. I, I've been in the the electric sector is is, is my background and and, and is what I, I am most uh, comfortable in. Uh, uh, but and they're in uh, unique situations with, with regulations and, and what have you. But I, I would say the electric sector from from ten ten years ago, uh, um, uh, maybe even uh, yeah, say ten years ago. Uh, from ten years ago to today is. Uh, quite a bit different uh, uh, than it uh, uh, over over the course of that time period. Uh, a lot of the other industries are absolutely catching up, though. Uh, oil and gas is uh, certainly right up there, but uh, a lot of the the industries uh, are ranging from uh, pharmaceuticals, mining, uh, uh, transportation. Uh, there, there's uh, uh, so many that are are focused. Uh, on uh, improving the, the security posture, and I, and I would also say it's it's largely not because of uh, the the 
um, so some of the most notable attacks that we've observed over the course of the few years. It, it, it's on the, the ransomware component to it. It is driving a level of investment that that uh, crisis or crash override uh, did not necessarily move the needle on. Uh, so from, from an investment standpoint, those are the, the, the uh, uh, real uh, kind of bellwether uh, incidents uh, over the last few years that have driven us to, to uh, many of the industries moving on, on towards improvements. Good, thanks. Um, so Kate, you, uh, you've, you've been, uh, you've had a lot of different, um, uh, you've had a lot of different experiences in your life. And, uh, you know, now you're a vulnerability analyst here, but one of the reasons that you're such a good vulnerability analyst, right, is because you were a, a red team operator uh, in an electric utility for a long time. Um, so in real life, Kate, you know, based on your experience, actually, you know, you know dropping bombs on people, what, uh, you know, what would you say is like the, the real example of a red team going against OT and uh, how IT and OT work together there and, you know, why it's so difficult to catch? Uh, well, again, the difficulty to catch is going to be the monitoring in the OT space because it's just not there in a lot of plants. Like even if, even if you've just monitored like the major plants that you have, there's still a bunch of off, offshoot ones, especially if you acquire it, like acquire a new one that you haven't done any testing on. Um, but I think it really depends completely on the plant and which site you're actually on. So a lot of cases, you're going to start at IT and move into OT through file servers or through whatever software packages or updates, kind of those types of channels. But I mean, if it's a completely new site where they still have routers and like what modems plugged into for their vendors access, like that could be just complete into OT access. So it really depends if you've already done the assessment once, usually you've cleaned up all of that initial access directly into OT. You know, once you've figured out what your choke points are in the environment, it makes it a lot easier. But if you haven't looked at it yet, it really, it's a giant question mark. Um, but for most cases, like if you have a pretty mature environment, you're going to have to go through IT first. And that, that does cause a lot of problems for most adversaries. Excellent, excellent insight. Um, the, uh, so Selena, um, you spend a lot of time talking to uh, you know, to, to IT and OT cybersecurity management folks um, as you go around the country and, and, and work with different entities. What, how, how should IT and OT talk together, right? Um, especially when it comes to software, firmware patching and solving the, you know, quote unquote, insecure and in, in inherent, insecure by design and inherent risks of ICS. Um, and how can we fix the disconnect that, that seems to exist between the two spaces? Do you have time for another webinar, Sergio? Um, I know, I know. If you could give me, <laughs> no, take that hour and distill it into two minutes would be amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a good question, right? And I think that this is something that um, a lot of uh, organizations struggle with, especially um, organizations that are potentially you know, less mature and are, are just getting started. Um, honestly, you know, when you talk to the folks uh, who work at Dragos, what we do and, and honestly we'll recommend, I know Rob says this a lot, is bring a box of donuts <laughs> or beers or what have you, you know, and, and, and just kind of get the conversation started, right? Identify where, you know, some of the pain points are, you know, kind of lay out what, you know, the, the, the different types of expectations are, you know, just really having those discussions and, and, and come from, you know, come from a place of, of this sort of like empathy and understanding, right? Because because people are going to have different priorities, right? You know, you kind of think about doing like a crown jewel analysis. In OT, that's going to be way different than the folks that you're going to be talking to in IT, certainly. Um, and so I think that just getting the sort of, you know, the, the conversation started and, and really kind of putting together a, a comprehensive cybersecurity framework that takes into account interviews and, and you know, questions asked from across both teams um, and, and making sure that, that everyone is kind of heard and, and certainly trying to, to work together from, from a place of, of getting everyone's voices. Uh, and that can certainly start with uh, donuts and beer. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a really difficult question, I think. Um, and I think, you know, actually my colleague, Leslie Carhart, she did a, a presentation at a, a conference about confessions of an ITOT marriage counselor. Um, and that was pretty interesting to kind of, you know, hear a lot of, of very common um, uh, complaints or things that, that, you know, kind of get you run into when you're just, just kind of starting up these conversations. Um, and so uh, it, it's, it's certainly a, not a unique problem, but one I think can be solved, you know, largely starting with uh, food and, and or drinks. 
Um, I think I think a lot of human problems just start with breaking bread, right? Um, or you know, do we solve them just by starting there? Um, I want to thank everyone for your time today. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have questions still, uh, please just keep dropping them in the Q and A channel. There, uh, we will get to them. We'll we'll uh, actually answer all your questions on the blog um, post, so you will get an answer from us. And I really appreciate your time today, um, Selena, Ben, Kate. Uh, I want to thank you for honestly the the months of work that it took. Uh, to get these these reports done and, and all of the data that had to get crunched and sometimes in a very manual mode to make this happen. So I want to I want to just thank you and, and give you my appreciation and the community's appreciation for for giving us some insight into the into the world of ICS cybersecurity. Um, so thank you very much. And I want to thank everyone who's attended for your time. I know everyone's time is super valuable. Um, and uh, even an hour you spend here today, hopefully uh, with us, you've, you've gained a little bit more insight into what's going on. 